Hey guys, it's Shaylin and I'm here today with another writing video. Super excited about today's topic. Today we're going to be talking about word choice and diction. When I asked you guys for topics you wanted me to talk about, a lot of people said like talk about prose, talk about like craft stuff, like the technical craft stuff. And I love talking about that stuff. It's one of my favorite things to talk about. And I can't believe I've never I've never done a video on word choice when word choice or diction, which just is a fancy way of saying word choice, is so important. Um, you can change one word in a sentence to a synonym, so a word with the same meaning, and it can completely change the impact of the sentence. It can even change the meaning. So it's really, really important to be choosing words thoughtfully with care. In a piece of writing, there are really two core components. There's the story, so what happens, and there's the form, so how you tell it. Word choice obviously comes down to the form. It's how you're gonna convey the story in your head. In many ways, a word is kind of the smallest unit within a piece of writing that has meaning on its own. Obviously, you have w letters that make up words. A single letter on its own doesn't really hold any comprehensible meaning, but a word on its own does hold comprehensible meaning. If you see the letter M, it doesn't really mean anything to you, it's just a letter, but if you put it within a word and you hear the word moon, or the word mammal, or the word mother, those all have meanings. That conveys a meaning to you. But that's why words need to be chosen with so much care. It's about choosing the words that best convey your story. So the first thing to consider with word choice is words that are in the character specific voice and lexicon. When you're creating voice and when you're therefore choosing words within the voice, you want to choose words that are harmonious with your character's lexicon. So this is not only considering words that they logically would use, so based on their age, where's their vocabulary at, based on their background, where what kind of words would be in their vocabulary, but also words that kind of convey their personality. I'm going to pepper in some examples over voiceover after each point here. So we're gonna start with this example on character voice. So this is from The Best Bad Things by Katrina Carrasco. He is handsome in a rough cut way, successful, a Scotsman, someone she might not have lamented a match with if her uncle had kept her pliant and bridled. Now the thought of marriage and its drudgery makes her squirm. Her corset bones creak. God damn this costume. She is weighted with draperies, pinned with dead curls, forced to sit straight as a stick. Dressed in her own clothes, she could sprawl, share Wheeler's fancy liquor. So the words that I've highlighted here are lamented, pliant, bridled, drudgery, draperies, pinned, and sprawl. And I've also specifically highlighted dead curls here because um, that's a very specific use of an adjective and I'm not gonna change it. The rest of them I've changed. I haven't changed dead, dead curls because I couldn't really think of a way to change dead. I don't know, dead is a pretty clear word. It's almost impossible to change the meaning there without completely removing the word, but I just think that it does really reveal a lot about the character that she's referring to her hair as like dead curls. There's some really specific word choice here I really especially want to highlight bridled. I think bridled is a triumph of word choice. It is the perfect word choice for this character in this situation. The implications of bridling a horse, reducing her in the context of marriage to the animal who is being broken and tamed and used for a use is really deep and character driven. So that is an absolutely incredible use of word choice and so in my revised version, I have made this much worse, so this is not an improvement. And I changed all these words that really build the voice into kind of like their more obvious, less voicey counterparts. So this is what we have here. He is handsome in a rough cut way, successful, a Scotsman, someone she might not have hated a match with if her uncle had kept her obedient and constrained. Now the thought of marriage and its struggle makes her squirm. Her corset bones creak. God damn this costume. She is weighted with cloth, styled with dead curls, forced to sit straight as a stick, dressed in her own clothes. She could drape, share Wheeler's fancy liquor. Changing lamented to hated is just a bit more of an obvious word. Kept her obedient and constrained compared to pliant and bridled. 
pliant and bridled. First of all, the sound of that is much more interesting. It's less obvious word choice, and those words just have much more impl interesting implications. Compared to obedient and constrained, which is more obvious, more overt, and there's nothing to really read into. Um, I changed drudgery to struggle. Drudgery is definitely a word we don't use too often in our contemporary word choice, contemporary lexicon, but this is a historical novel, and so changing it to struggle removes some of that historical voice. Um, I changed draperies to cloth, again removed the specificity that builds the historical voice. I changed pinned to styled. I think that the fact that she is pinned with dead curls to pin, to pin down, to hold in place, to hold in place with something sharp that could be even painful, whereas just styled almost sounds quite pleasant. And then I changed sprawl to drape. I think sprawl has a more active implication of I am taking up space, I am sprawling, I am breaking out of constraint, whereas drape is more inactive. You would drape a coat over a chair. It's something that you do with something rather than sprawling, which is almost rebellious in its implication. So just by changing the words essentially to synonym, but words that are synonyms or serve the same purpose in the sentence, we have completely changed the character voice. The second point is to choose words that fit into the story's tone and atmosphere. This is what I call a linguistic ecosystem, and it is essentially how you create atmosphere. I have an old video on atmosphere, and I don't really talk about this because I don't think I had synthesized it into these specific terms yet, but I do talk about this in my video called 15 Tips for Better Shorts, for Writing Better Short Stories or something. I'll leave a link to that. It's timestamped so you can just scroll to that point if you want. But the whole video is pretty great so you should watch the whole thing. Linguistic ecosystem is a term that I use. I think it really effectively explains kind of what I mean by that. Harmonious use of language. Just how there are certain plants that do not grow in certain regions. It is too cold or it is too hot for that, in that ecosystem to grow that plant. There may be certain words that do not grow in the ecosystem of your story, but other words that grow in abundance. Word choice isn't just about choosing the best word for this specific instance, but about choosing words that are in harmony with all of the words around them. This is the concept of patterning. You know, I've talked about patterns in a lot of videos. This is a form of patterning. This honestly sounds more complicated than it is. Literally, it's just using words that feel like they go together. Ask yourself, how does my story feel? Like, what is its tone? What is its atmosphere? Is it very delicate and soft and dreamy? Well, in that case, use words that to you feel very delicate and soft and dreamy. When I think I'm writing something very delicate, soft, dreamy, I might use words like lace, cotton, pollen, dandelion. You know, like, these are really soft words. They have soft sounds, as opposed to something really intense that just wouldn't fit. So I didn't create linguistic ecosystems from scratch, I just went through a couple of my stories and pulled the linguistic ecosystem. I tried making them from scratch, but I found that that was kind of pointless. This linguistic ecosystem is from a story called How to Slaughter. In this one I found threads of nature primarily, religion, animals, and also violence. So the next one is probably the most intense. This is from a story called I Am a Wolf in Wolf's Clothing. The main character of this story is like a very intense person, and so we're gonna see a very different linguistic ecosystem. We see a lot more complex words. The How to Slaughter one had more like grounded natural words, whereas here we're seeing more like complex Latin-rooted words, words like neurochemical photosynthesis, and there's a lot of movement and there's a lot of intensity. All right, so now I have two points on picking more vivid words. We're gonna talk about verbs and we're gonna talk about nouns. We're gonna start with verbs. You wanna improve your word choice, start with your verbs. You can do so much work for a piece and for your overall writing style just by focusing on choosing stronger verbs. Verbs are the most active, visceral, vivid part of a sentence, so choosing more interesting verbs, more visceral verbs, can really, really punch up your prose without adding any extra words. You keep the same word count, so it's not really necessarily going to make it purple or overwrought, um, it's just going to really lift it up. So the key with verbs, what you want to think about is defamiliarizing them. There are a lot of verbs that are just inherent. They're, they're exactly what we'd expect. For example, what does the sun do? The sun shines. In most cases, 
When you read a sentence about the sun, what is the sun doing? The sun is shining. If you had a sentence like, the sun shone through the leaves, the verb in that case is very familiar. It's not doing anything. We could replace it, we could say something like, the sun pierced through the leaves. That one's a bit more intense, it's a bit sharper. We could say something like, the sun laced through the leaves. That one's very soft. The image is more interesting. First of all, both of those create different but stronger images. The sun shone through the leaves doesn't create very interesting image, at least for me, because it's so familiar. When it comes to verbs, I love verbs so much that I actually keep a list of verbs in a note on my phone, and whenever I find a good verb that I don't want to forget, let's say I'm having a good sifting through a thesaurus session and I find some good verbs and I don't really have a place for all of them in this scene right now, I add them to my verb list. It's organized alphabetically. When I need some good verbs, check my verb list. Highly recommend curating your own verb list. So now we're gonna look at defamiliarizing some verbs. Beyond the narrow bar of sand, scrub grass dried by the summer grew up an outcrop and above that a skein of foliage. Teak trees wrapped in vines and decorated with hibiscus blooms. A mangrove tree grew up the bluff and its roots lay in the sand like a pit of hibernating snakes. Palm trees left shadows shaped like stars on the beach. The skull of the tree drifted in the breeze. Those are pretty weak verbs. I kind of lifted up those verbs and turned them all into verbs that are a bit more interesting. In this case, I tried to turn every single verb into something a bit more interesting, so maybe to you it seems like too much. Maybe it seems like an overcrowding of strange verbs, but for the sake of this example, I wanted to do them all. I did end up leaving one of them just because I couldn't really find a way to make it more original. Beyond the narrow bar of sand, scrub grass brittled by the summer scratched up an outcrop, and above that a skein of foliage, teak trees strangled in vines and studded with hibiscus blooms. A mangrove tree grew up the bluff, and its roots snarled in the sand like a pit of hibernating snakes. Palm trees stamped shadows shaped like stars on the beach. The skull of the tree bobbled in the breeze. So the trees being strangled in vines is much more visceral then wrapped in vines, decorated with hibiscus blooms, seemed a bit out of place. It was a bit too intentional for a wild plant. So I turned that into studded. The roots lying in the sand, that verb was a bit inconducive with the simile. It says the roots were like a pit of hibernating snakes, so instead I said that they snarled. And you want to do a similar thing with nouns. With nouns, I think it's all about specifying your nouns. The problem with verbs is when they are familiar. The problem with nouns, I think, is when they are vague. So if you had the sentence, a plant grew on the windowsill, plant is vague. You know how many types of plants there are? Like, I'll google it right now. Scientists now have an answer. There are about 391,000 species of plants. So when you see those vague words like plants, you want to specify that. You could say, you know, what type of plant? A dracaena grew on the windowsill. A ficus grew on the windowsill. There are so many types of plants, so specify it. Not only is it a more interesting word, dracaena is a way more interesting word than plant, but it's also a more interesting image. If someone knows what a dracaena looks like, they're gonna picture something more specific. Even if they don't, they're gonna know that it's a plant. From the context, the word itself will create more intrigue in the sentence. Research is definitely your best friend when it comes to nouns. I have a research tab open every single time that I write because I'm constantly stopping to research things, and a lot of the time it's to find more specific nouns. You know how many times I have like had something in mind, but I didn't know what the word for it was, and instead of stopping to describe it, I was able to find a really specific word. The amount of times that I've been describing a window and been like, is there a name for like the bar, like the center bar frame of a window? I don't know, googling parts of a window. Parts of blank is one of my most common Google searches because it helps me find more specific nouns when I identify them in my work. And when you use more specific nouns, it can also really help add credibility to the subject matter. When I was working on my novel, Honey Vinegar, it's set in a logging town. The main character is not a logger, but a lot of people around her are. And so I did a lot of research into logging terminology to find specific words. I was able to use the diction that was accurate to the char main character, because she would know these words. She's grown up around this. And it makes it so much more convincing. When you read it and there are all these specific logging terms, you go, oh, maybe the author really like grew up in a logging town or something. I didn't. We are going to specify some nouns so this is the opening, the original paragraph with the vague nouns. A bird screeched from inside the trees, branches hung over the beach, 
rotting fruit melted in the sand. It was only evening, but constellations of stars already stung the sky. The moon hung over the water. Here, I want to especially specify birds, trees, and fruit. Those are all things we could easily specify. And constellations of stars, I either want to specify that or I want to turn it into just constellations or stars. Constellations are made of stars. And so we shouldn't need to say both. This is a vague noun, but it's also too embellished. So I'm going to embellish it more just because that's what we're talking about. But you could also easily make it less embellished um, if you don't feel that contributes to your piece. So here's the revised version. A macaw screeched from inside the jungle. Palm fronds hung over the beach. Rotting coconuts melted in the sand. It was only evening, but constellations Cassiopeia, Ursa Minor, Cepheus already stung the sky. The moon hung over the ocean. I decided to specify them. Maybe this could imply that the character knows how to navigate where they are by the stars. My next tip is to use words that sound like what they mean. This is where my verb list is gonna come in. So much of word choice for me comes down to sound. The musicality of the words and how they work within the sentence. It's not just about the meaning, it's about the sound. Um, you know, especially when I'm looking at synonyms of words and I'm trying to pick one, a lot of the time I pick the one that I like the sound of the best in this specific context. A lot of words, their sound reflects the meaning of the word, and those are often the strongest ones to use. And you'll see this a lot with verbs. So I'm gonna go through my verb list and I'm going to list some of the ones that stand out to me because they sound like what they mean. Bevel. Bevel has been one of my favorite verbs recently. I've been using it in like everything. The word bevels in. Carbonate, it's got really short staccato syllables. Course, it, it, it's coarse when you say it. Drift, the word becomes lighter towards the end, like it's drifting off. Same with diffuse. Flutter, the T is in the middle, literally do have a fluttering sound. Pirouette, sift, sift is one of my favorite verbs. The word it does sift through your teeth as you say it, which I think is fun. But basically, let's just make a point. Words that sound like what they mean invoke this extra visceral quality to the sentence. And so for me, sound is so important. Also, even when I'm choosing nouns, a lot of the time I will be looking for some good specific nouns. Let's say I have a sentence where a main character puts on perfume. So I might Google types of perfume. I'll probably pick the perfume that I end up picking based on what it sounds like and how do I like how that sound fits into the sentence? What does it evoke? How does it fit into the linguistic atmosphere? So let's start with this example. The clouds zipped across the sky and snapped open. Storm water twirled over the city. So sonically, clouds nor rain do these things. Clouds are large and fluffy and damp and clumsy. They don't zip and they don't snap. To zip implies speed and to be aerodynamic. An arrow would zip, a plane would zip, a cloud wouldn't zip. A board would snap, but a cloud wouldn't snap. It's not brittle enough. I did specify that this was storm water, not rain, just to be clear. It wouldn't twirl. Twirl is too fun, it's too light. That is not sonically what it is doing. It is doing something actually a lot more vicious. Bloated and ruptured both sounded more like things a cloud could do. And then I went with slash for storm water since it more accurately captured the context of the situation. Another really important part of word choice is condensing your constructions. This is something you guys will be told so much. You've probably heard it before, especially when it comes to things like adverbs or adjectives but so often you can create a stronger word by condensing multiple words into one. So for example, a dark brown door. You would be better off just finding a material that is dark brown, so you could say a mahogany door. That's a case where we had two adjectives, right? We had an adjective and then we had an adjective modifying the adjective because it was brown and it was dark brown. So just smush them into one. Not only is mahogany a more interesting word, but it's also fewer words and in general, fewer words lets the words you have shine more. The more you can pare back the excess, the more those really well chosen words that you have will be able to shine. I think of this one because this is an example from one of my line editing videos and I, I still thought of it. There was a sentence that was in the line editing that someone had submitted. It was like, the stars shone playfully. And so what we did in that video was we took shone playfully and we condensed it into one verb. The verb we ended up picking was wink 
because wink is playful. And so if the stars are winking, they're shining playfully. However, condensing constructions also means cutting basically the padding, you know, the weasel words, words that don't add anything. Those extra words like very or that or just or only. If you watch my line editing video and I might even have a second one up by now. That's a really big focus of those videos is just basically just cutting the excess words. Those strong words that you've now put in so much work into choosing well, those verbs, those specific nouns, they'll be able to shine more. I do want to be clear, there's nothing wrong with having adjectives or adverbs. I use them all the time in my work. The reason you'll often be told to avoid them is because they're often not used well. If you can condense it into a single stronger word, then the sentence will probably be better off. That way, when you do choose to use an adverb or an adjective, it has a lot more impact, it's well earned. You really only want to use adverbs or adjectives that add a necessary modifier to the sentence. So let's look at condensing constructions. So this is our initial construction here. She slips into the dress and cinches the waistband tight around her hips. It's a bit too small for her. She runs her hands over the satin. So let's edit this. She slips into the dress and cinches the waistband and we're gonna cut tight around her hips because the waistband is around your hips. To cinch is to pull tight, so it's redundant to tell us both those things. It's a bit too small for her. We don't need a bit, we could just say it's too small. Of course, for her, she's the one wearing it, so we could just say it's too small. And then she runs her hands over the satin. Um, if you're touching something, it's probably with your hands, so I'm just gonna change that to a singular verb. So we've condensed this to, she slips into the dress and cinches the waistband, it's too small, she traces the satin. Another thing you can consider when it comes to word choice is choosing words that have the proper weight. Sometimes you use words that are, say, too intense at moments where it's not warranted, or maybe are too light or too fun at moments that are very serious. This can either cause melodrama because you're using words that are too heavy, too intense, or it can cause awkward dissonance between the subject matter and the word choice. If you're describing something very intense, but you use a very fun, light, playful diction, unless you're doing that intentionally, you know, to reveal something important about the character, you're creating this really weird dissonance where the word choice is not in harmony with the subject matter. In general, words that feel heavier are going to be abstract words. So words that don't have a physical form, words that are concepts or emotions, you know, emotion words like angry, happy, sad, joyful, etc., etc. Concepts, you know, like, beauty or justice or conscience, you know, these are very heavy words. Now let's look at word weight. The apple is ripe and full of lifeblood. She rips out a chunk of the flesh and its nectar strangles down her throat. And I just want to have a note that flesh is really only a melodramatic and too heavy here in the context of so many other heavy words. The flesh of a fruit is the technical term, so it would be fine if the words surrounding it were a bit toned down. Now, when I read this, I ask, is this a life-saving apple? Is this like the original sin? Is she dying of hunger? Because these words are all very heavy, so they imply an extremely heavy context. If she is literally just eating an apple in her kitchen, these words are too heavy, and they are an example of purple prose. This is how purple prose tends to happen. So let's edit this. These are the changes that I made, and I rewrote it to the apple is ripe. She bites a chunk out of the flesh and juice drips down her throat. This is much simpler. Obviously, it's not very interesting writing, but it's also not a very interesting situation. But the words here for the context are more appropriate. But the reverse can also happen. We can also have words that are not heavy enough for the context. So here's an example of that. She pulls through the sand, fingers sore and nails scuffed. Sunburn tans her face and thirst dries her throat. If she doesn't keep moving forward, forward, she will lie in the sand and nap. So whatever is happening here, it is not fun, but why such mild language? Pulls through the sand is pretty weak. Fingers are just sore. Nails are just scuffed. Sunburn is just tanning her face. Not doesn't even seem that bad. She's just getting a tan. Moving is a very vague word and she will lie in the sand and nap. That actually sounds quite nice. So let's revise that to match the more intense situation. It seems that she is lost in the desert. She claws through the sand, fingers bleeding and nails cracked. Sunburn rashes her face and thirst sears her throat. If she doesn't keep fighting forward, forward, she will collapse in the sand and wilt. Which leads to the next point, which is about abstract versus concrete language. I have talked about this in past videos, so I'm not going to go super in depth here. If you want more information on abstract versus concrete language, as well as specificity, I do have a whole video on specificity, which is literally about 
specificity and concrete versus abstract language. But when you're choosing your diction, you do want to look for concrete words and favor them over abstract words. So abstract words are just words that don't have a physical form, like I just mentioned. Concrete words are words that do have a physical form or can be perceived with the, sen with the senses. When I say lamp or tree or desk, you know what these things are. They have a physical form. You know what to picture. But going back to those abstract words, when I say conscience or justice or beauty, who knows what you picture? Um, those words are much heavier, but they're also abstract. Especially when you're writing descriptively, you do want to avoid abstract words because they don't actually have any inherent descriptive value. So here we have an example using abstract language. The air smelled of contentment and the summers of her childhood. Contentment is an abstract word, um, that's just an emotion, and the summers of her childhood, we actually don't know anything about her childhood. Maybe we do in the context of the story, but I don't know. We don't know what that smells like. Everyone's childhood is going to be associated with different smells. Maybe the summers of your childhood aren't even conducive to contentment. Maybe she had a very traumatic childhood, and so this is a contradictory statement. The air smelled like willow pollen and cotton candy, sweet and mingling with salt, just like it had when her grandmother took her to the pier each summer. As our final point, I wanted to talk about using resources. There is absolutely nothing wrong with using resources for your word choice. In fact, I'd recommend it. I'd highly recommend using a thesaurus. I have a thesaurus and a reverse dictionary open every single time that I draft. It's a great way to expand your vocabulary and also just remind you of words that maybe aren't the first one that came to mind. It is not a cheat in any way. In fact, it takes a lot of practice and skill to use a thesaurus effectively and pick the right synonyms. So don't feel afraid of using a thesaurus, but a word of warning because they do need to be used smartly. If when you use a thesaurus you lean towards words that you aren't familiar with and then you put them into your work without double checking their meaning, you can run into issues. So as a little anecdote, I had a TA in a sociology class once who was warning us about this because a friend of hers had been writing a paper and in the paper, there was a sentence where she had said, like, he is manipulative. But she felt she'd already used the word manipulative too many times, so she plugged it into a thesaurus, and one of the results that came up was gerrymandering. Gerrymandering comes up in a thesaurus when you search manipulative because it is a form of political manipulation, but it does not make any sense in the context of the sentence. And so she put it in the paper, and it didn't make any sense. That's what happens when you use a thesaurus, take words that you don't know, don't double check what they mean. So be very careful when you're using one if you're going to use words you've never heard of before. Just do that extra little bit of research to make sure it makes sense. But they are a great tool. Definitely don't be afraid of using tools. Like I said, research is great. I literally Google things constantly in order to find those specific details. It's like a constant necessary part of my writing process. I don't have just this infinite well of specific details that exist in my brain. I'm not that worldly. I've got to look them up. And there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, the practice comes from knowing when to look up specific details and how to choose ones that will benefit your piece, not just having omniscient knowledge of every single thing on earth that you can use to populate your writing with good word choice. So that is all for this video on word choice. I do have a few more videos related to this topic that I will leave in the description. Thank you so much for watching. If you have any questions, you can always send me an ask on Tumblr, and I'll see you in another video. Bye!